it is one of the world's most enduring mysteries. Could the modern relative of an ancient monster be living in the mountains and forests of North America? From footprint casts to the most famous piece of film, enhanced to expose details never before seen. Experts pro and con will also conduct a startling experiment. Physiological impossibility. As we examine the best evidence for a creature known as Bigfoot. This creature is definitely not human. Stories of sightings date back a thousand years. Natives of North America's Pacific Northwest gave it a name, Sasquatch. We have detailed descriptions of Sasquatches back at least as far as 1839. Up to eight feet tall and weighing over 600 pounds, it's described as a massive primate. So we're talking about an animal that, that is very large. But unlike a gorilla, this animal is fully bipedal, walking upright on two legs, as only humans can. When I hear a, a Sasquatch being described for me, there's certain things I'm looking for. Every year, there are dozens of documented Bigfoot sightings in North America. Dr. John Bindernagel is a respected wildlife biologist and former advisor to the United Nations. After spending the last decade examining the evidence, he has come to one startling conclusion. I accept the Sasquatch as an existing North American mammal. The long arms, and certainly the flat face, uh, lacking the prominent snout of the bear. They'll often be deep-set eyes, brow ridges maybe. The flat nose, uh, often with outward-facing nostrils. Thin lips, ears almost always covered with hair, broad shoulder. Although Dr. Bindernagel has recorded nearly 200 eyewitness accounts, there are more than 2,000 known reports from across North America. The greatest concentration of sightings are from the coastlines and mountainous interiors of the northwestern United States and Canada. To me, it's very interesting. People encounter Sasquatches, if not on a weekly basis in North America, every month. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Tim Martindale, who spends a lot of time fishing and camping, claims he had a chance encounter two years ago that changed his life. I'm trembling at the thought of it even right now because it's as if it happened yesterday. It's, it's burned into my psyche. I can recall every little detail of it. Driving near his home in Merritt, British Columbia, Tim saw something in the forest that left him stunned. What the hell is that? I had assumed it may have been a father and a son. It had been down on its one knee to, to uh, looked like either drinking water or eating maybe vegetation or something like that. I could see his arms, his, the shape of everything, and not knowing a whole lot about them at the time, I, I just came to the conclusion that, that they must be uh, Sasquatches that I was looking at. There, there's no way they could have been people. They were too big in size, girth, and they definitely weren't bears. That, that's, it, that's for sure. Today, Tim is still haunted by that event. The whole world slowed down when I saw this because it was just disbelief. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Now, Tim Martindale has joined the ranks of thousands of amateurs searching for what they commonly call Bigfoot. What he's described really does fit, you know, both behavior and anatomy of an upright great ape. This description adds up to a real animal. Only two months ago, a couple who were fishing in a remote part of the same watershed were woken up at 5.30 in the morning when something was throwing large rocks into the river. And they were pretty spooked because they were really out there by themselves. They probably won't tent there again. That was likely a Sasquatch. So the projectile throwing, the throwing of large, heavy projectile is unique to the Sasquatch. We're talking about an animal with superhuman strength. Most eyewitnesses are not looking for notoriety. They don't believe that Sasquatches exist. They've had basically the misfortune of seeing one, and they're having to come to terms with it. Of the thousands of people who claim to have seen the creature, the best known are Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin and their famous 59-second piece of film. They had made many trips into the mountains of Northern California looking for evidence. On October 20th, 1967, they found it. 
and captured this brief but astonishing footage of what appears to be a female Sasquatch. Without a doubt, the most significant piece of photographic evidence for Bigfoot or Sasquatch is, remains the Patterson-Gimlin film and still remains probably one of the most controversial. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is considered the leading academic authority currently researching Bigfoot. Even his critics have high regard for his contributions in the fields of physical anthropology and primate studies. I think there's a very credible case to be made for the existence of a large primate. Dr. Meldrum has analyzed this famous footage hundreds of times, but never at this level of clarity, thanks to sophisticated computer imaging software. The Patterson-Gimlin film remains rather controversial, probably because of its dramatic effect. It, uh, it either has to be the real McCoy, or it is one of the most uh, intriguing pieces of, of hoaxing, uh, if it were simply a man in a fur suit that has ever been uh, contrived. In our quest to gain new insights into the mystery, Dr. Meldrum and other scientists will also get the opportunity to examine plaster cast footprints taken from the 1967 film site. The late anthropologist Dr. Grover Krantz made the casts. He was one of the first scientists to break ranks and seriously consider the existence of Sasquatch. The Smithsonian Institute provided these exclusive Bigfoot casts to our scientists for forensic analysis. Right, we'll get this on the pedestal here. The casts are brought to this lab at Idaho State University to be scanned into the computer, creating virtual 3D models. The scans will provide greater detail of the anatomical features that created the yeah, print. There's that dimple we were talking about. Here's the toe stems. You can really see the degree of flexion of the toes from that perspective as well. Well, the technology that we have at our disposal now allows us to examine these artifacts, these 30-year-old artifacts, in a way that has never been realized before. In the absence of an actual body, the best physical evidence available to Dr. Meldrum are footprints taken from areas of recorded sightings. It is the uh, next best thing to physical evidence because it's a, it's a real trace of the, the physical existence of an animal. Dr. Meldrum's lab at Idaho State University contains over 200 samples of mysterious big feet, the largest collection of Sasquatch tracks in the world. Because of the precise and consistent anatomy of the prints, widespread geographical locations, and corroboration with what are said to be credible sightings, Dr. Meldrum is convinced an undeniable pattern is emerging. It's not like uh, uh, a case of uh, just haphazard collection of odd, uh, odd tracks. The vast majority of things that I have examined speak to a very consistent uh, story a very consistent image of, a, of the foot of a large primate. The question of faked footprints is always considered, but Meldrum believes the vast majority of prints couldn't be created by the average prankster. I think I'm in a very good position to discriminate between uh, a, a blatant hoax and something which to my eye is, is very credible. They do suggest or indicate the existence of a species of, of bipedal giant ape on the North American continent. With intricate footprints, consistent eyewitness accounts, and a startling piece of film, Bigfoot researchers believe they're amassing a solid body of evidence. But critics are quick to point out inconsistencies, even between casts from the same footprints. If this depression along this edge here is real, it's different from those other footprints, so why is it different from those other footprints? Next, both sides debate the Bigfoot legend, leading to the ultimate test on best evidence. Is a massive bipedal primate living in North America's wilderness? According to some scientists, Bigfoot or Sasquatch isn't just a legend, it's a real living species. I can remember the first experience I had seeing footprints in the field. And, and I have to say that uh, the, the hairs in the back of my neck stood up out of the excitement of the realization that there really may indeed be something to this. But this astonishing theory has yet to be accepted by the wider scientific community. 
Until we find tangible evidence, it's really almost not permissible for scientists to, to claim that it exists. For every piece of evidence and theory about an upright, bipedal North American ape, there are scientific arguments and counterclaims. We enter the bone-filled lab of Dr. David Began to examine this evolutionary mystery and determine if Sasquatch is the missing link between humans and apes. I won't be convinced of the existence of Sasquatch until I see hard evidence. The paleoanthropologist is renowned for his research into early man and ancient primates. It's been speculated that Bigfoot is a descendant of a Miocene ape that lived before apes and humans diverged, called Giganopithecus. Like Dr. Meldrum, Dr. Began also examines the Smithsonian Bigfoot cast from the site of the famous Patterson-Gimlin film. Immediately, Dr. Began notices discrepancies in the anatomy of the alleged Sasquatch prints. Here you can make out all of the separate toes, like, I hate to say it, but as if somebody really wanted to make sure that all the toes were there. If Sasquatch is a close relative of the great apes, Began wonders why the big toe is not divergent, sticking out to the side like all other apes. All other primates have a foot that's more like a hand, functionally, than human feet are. So even large mountain gorillas whose feet are most like modern human feet, they still have an opposable big toe that they can use to grasp onto things and climb it. When apes walk either bipedally or quadrupedally, uh, they don't use their big toes at all, and that's one of the reasons they have this mid-tarsal break. The human foot has two arches. They form a dome to keep us erect while standing or walking. The foot is essentially a stiff platform with a flexible big toe that propels us forward. An ape's foot lacks an arch and doesn't rely on its toes to propel itself forward. So how does its foot flex? The only way to explain the lack of an arch is to talk about a mid-tarsal break, which means the mid-tarsal joint is the joint between these larger bones, the back of the foot, and these smaller bones that join those bones to these metatarsals. That's the mid-tarsal joint. So there's this break that prevents the formation of an arch, right, in a footprint. The mid-tarsal joint or break found in apes allows their feet to propel the animal forward. It is their alternative to a flexible big toe. So it doesn't make sense to me that you would have a mid-tarsal break but an enlarged big toe that's pressed up against the other toes. Lacking the anatomical requirements needed for a half-human, half-ape creature to move efficiently, scientists find the evidence less than credible. You get a footprint that is biomechanically ambiguous, in my view, and no corroborating evidence, no fossils, no bones, nothing else. And even if scientists accept that a massive, ancient primate migrated from Asia to North America thousands of years ago, could it live in this new habitat? Essentially, this is a dietary wasteland for an ape. Dr. Nina Jablonski is an anthropologist and leading authority on the evolution of primates and humans. The circumstantial evidence would indicate that Bigfoot simply could not exist. After considering the question of whether an ape species could live in North America, Dr. Jablonski is convinced it could not adapt to this new world. Apes are relatively big-bodied creatures for the most part, but more importantly, they have big brains. And in order to supply those big brains with energy, apes have to eat quite energy-rich foods. How can these animals live in an environment that is so poor in high-quality foods? While the issue of food is one matter, Dr. Jablonski raises another. Where does Sasquatch sleep? Large animals, when large apes live in a forest, uh, they routinely make night nests in which to sleep and to be secure. Uh, We've never, in the areas in which Bigfoot is said to have lived, ever found anything like uh, a night nest. To survive winter in mountainous terrain, the anthropologist believes Bigfoot would need to do something that apes do not, hibernate. 
No primate that we know of has the ability to hibernate. Now, this is a real problem. If you can't hibernate, you can't get away from the lack of food, you're going to get very, very, very thin in a hurry, uh, or you're going to die. So I think Bigfoot, the idea of it, becomes a physiological impossibility. There is another type of evidence those on the scientific search for Bigfoot also consider, eyewitness testimony. John Turtle is a psychology professor whose research specialty is eyewitness evidence. Our whole culture, our whole civilization is filled with examples of people saying that they saw something. We are talking about the average person who, for reasons often that he's not aware of, can come to believe that he's seen something that's not really there. The eyewitnesses are definitely fallible. Not everybody right at the time believes that they're seeing Bigfoot. They'll tell the story to someone else. That person will interpret it for them and go, that's very similar to what happened to me last week. Citing anatomical inconsistencies, ecological contradictions, and the unreliability of eyewitnesses, it will take more to convince these scientists that an unknown primate walks the earth. It just strikes me as unlikely that after all of these years, there would be no concrete evidence of this extremely large primate if it really existed. Is Sasquatch a perpetual hoax? Or could it be one of the greatest evolutionary discoveries in history? Our scientists challenge the evidence point for point, next on Best Evidence. Is a massive, unusual primate living in the dense forests of North America? This animal may indeed exist. Or is Bigfoot one of the greatest hoaxes of mankind? Extreme claims require extreme evidence. In our quest for the best evidence, leading scientists present their strongest cases for and against. We begin with one of the most fundamental questions. If Sasquatch exists, where are the remains? Well, if there were large-bodied apes living in places that people frequent, we would find bones, we would find fossils. Those who spend the most time in the field investigating Sasquatch offer this explanation. Bones break down, teeth sink into the ground. These things don't stick around quite as long as many people think. It's at the top of its food chain. It has no natural predators. So when it dies, scavengers will quickly dismember and disperse that body and, and the bones will uh, be scattered. Those bones that remain, though, are not going to persist very long because wet coniferous forests notoriously have acidic soils which are not conducive to the preservation of bones or of fossils. You can find bones of other mammals, bears in particular, in these soils that supposedly don't preserve bones that well. I work uh, at a, a fossil swamp site, a site that has what had highly acidic soil in Hungary that's 10 million years old, and it's chock full of bones. Advocates for Bigfoot counter with an incredible fact about the fossil record of certain primates. People are often surprised to learn that although chimpanzees have been residents of Africa for over seven million years, until last year we had absolutely no fossils of a chimpanzee in Africa. There's no real fossil evidence for any great apes, in fact, apart from this tiny sample of chimpanzee teeth that's very recent. Um, but, I, I don't see that as a relevant issue because we have thousands of specimens of gorillas and we don't have a single Sasquatch. Explorers have looked for this animal with great energy and vigor over the last 50 years and haven't come up with any convincing traces. Why don't we find some scat? Why don't we find some, some hair samples? For other scientists, Another primary question casts shadows of doubt. How can an ape the size of Bigfoot survive in North America? An animal with a relatively big brain, which is Bigfoot, probably had, could not have lived. Big brains require a lot of energy, and 
cold environments or even seasonal environments outside of the uh, outside of the tropics don't provide the foods that provide those energy sources to the animals. But after years of studying what is said to be prime Bigfoot habitat, biologist Dr. John Bindernagel disagrees. This habitat we're walking through now is, is classic West Coast Sasquatch habitat. But in addition to all the vegetation, the berries, the roots, the, the succulent leaves in the spring, there's the salmon in the fall, there's the seafood resources, the, the shellfish resources along the coast. It's really quite rich. So it's theoretically possible that an ape could have adapted to the kinds of environments that are found in, in the Pacific Northwest. But just because it's theoretically possible doesn't mean that it, it's, it's true. Those who investigate sightings also believe the animal exhibits another curious behavior. Bigfoot is a creature of the night. Because of the large number of Sasquatch reports at night, it's not out of the question that, 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 that a great ape could be mainly nocturnal. But the idea of a nocturnal great ape goes against the laws of nature. All of the close relatives of Bigfoot, the apes today, are diurnal, are day-living animals. And in order for them to find the foods that they need to eat, the high-energy fruits and so forth, they need to be able to look at the colors of things in the forest. Large nocturnal animals have specializations in their eyes that uh, allow them to gather as much light as possible so they can see well during the night. You know, we're talking eyes the size of a softball. It just doesn't correspond to the, the general patterns of higher primates. Believers maintain that Bigfoot could be a missing link between apes and humans. If that's so, could it have descended from Gigantopithecus? An enormous ape, scientists agree, lived in Asia more than 200,000 years ago? And could it have migrated to North America across a land bridge that no longer exists? We have a candidate as a, a link to Bigfoot that is the, the right size, in the right place, at the right time. It could very easily have migrated into North America. There is no evidence to indicate that Bigfoot, the Gigantopithecus, uh, if it were Bigfoot, uh, either migrated, dispersed outside of these tropical areas in Asia, or that it made it into North America during the last ice age or any other time. The reliability of eyewitness accounts also falls under scrutiny. Today, this is as true for court cases as it is for Sasquatch. There's no question that uh, eyewitness accounts are not the most reliable form of data. But one has to uh, take into account, though, the remarkable consistency and, and the pervasiveness of this experience that is shared by so many people. For centuries, Science has gotten us as far as it has because we've tried to remove the person, the individual, from our attempt to understand how the world works. Well, the reliability of eyewitness testimony has been an issue for uh, about 100 years now. Psychology professor John Turtle specializes in the study of eyewitness evidence. Eyewitnesses are definitely fallible in, in many situations. To prove his point, he demonstrates the phenomenon of priming where an observer can be led into mistaken perceptions when they see a series of similar things. I see a duck. I see a duck. And what do you see now? I see a duck. Turtle's duck could also be a rabbit. I think this demonstration makes the point that it can be what you experience in that moment or in that uh, particular event that, that influences what you see. But what about witnesses who still say they didn't see a duck, a rabbit, or anything else but a Sasquatch? We're not talking about people lying. We're talking about the average person who, for reasons often that he's not aware of, can come to believe that he's seen something that's not really there. So why do people see Sasquatches? We see the example of the Bigfoot sightings as the way that the brain works in its attempt to try to decipher reality uh, that leads us to sometimes see things that aren't really what they look like. But Dr. John Bindernagel disagrees. The numerous eyewitness accounts he's recorded usually involve people who are far from seeking attention. It's somewhere between 100 and 200 people that I have actually talked to about their eyewitness account. I'm hearing them say, I don't want my name used. 
I'm hearing them say, you know, I, I had to go to bed with all the lights on in the house because I was so scared. This element of distress that comes with seeing an animal that's not supposed to exist. Since his research began a decade ago, Dr. John Bindernagel is drawn to those who claim to have had Bigfoot encounters. For me, the most compelling evidence is actually a combination of the eyewitness reports and the tracks which corroborate them. One of the most distinctive features from my perspective as a student of, of foot anatomy and, and uh, the resulting footprints is this feature which is referred to as the mid-tarsal break. This ape-like feature allows the midfoot to flex in a continuous rolling step, unlike an arched human foot. The Sasquatch foot is really quite fascinating in this respect that it seems to have retained that ape-like characteristic of midfoot flexibility while adapting to a terrestrial bipedal mode of locomotion. When apes walk either bipedally or quadrupedally, uh, they don't use their big toes at all, and that's one of the reasons they have this mid-tarsal break. But the curi curious thing to me is that it still has this enlarged big toe, which is, not, which is only characteristic of, of humans. The human foot is a fairly rigid platform that's used to propel our body weight over fairly even terrain. Whereas the ape foot, and in this case the Sasquatch foot, is a much more flexible platform that allows for greater accommodation to irregularities in the surface of the ground that it moves across. Newly enhanced footage and an elaborate experiment next on Best Evidence. It is one of the most controversial pieces of film footage in history. In 1967, two men, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, were investigating reports of Bigfoot sightings near Bluff Creek in Northern California. After nearly two weeks in the woods, Patterson and Gimlin stumbled on an incredible creature and claimed to capture the first Sasquatch images ever on film. Since then, countless theories have tried to support or discredit the iconic footage. Although I've examined this footage literally hundreds, if not thousands of times, every time I look at it, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, by the implications of it. Never before broadcast until now, leading Bigfoot authority Dr. Jeff Meldrum analyzes a new digitally enhanced copy of the film. Well, the enhanced version of the Patterson-Gimlin film provides a much greater clarity than I think has ever been appreciated before. For Dr. Meldrum, enhanced film doesn't finally reveal a man in a fur suit. I'm struck by the fact that what is portrayed here is an animal that is effective within its, its environment. It leads to new details that only deepen the mystery. Things like uh, the movement of the shoulder blade beneath the skin, uh, the definition of particular muscles in the shoulders and in the arms. After studying footprints from where the film was shot, Dr. Meldrum is most interested in exactly how the bipedal animal moves. Uh, the remarkable aspects of this footage still remain for me, from my perspective, my expertise, um, here from the ankles down. The action of the feet is so telling and uh, attempts to fabricate costumes to do this always falls short when it comes to the feet. And in this situation, we have the flexibility of the feet, which correlates so well with the record of the, of the footprint casts that were documented at the site. He is convinced the walking style is not only unique, but its gait is neither fully human nor ape. The uh, smoothness, the subtlety of, of, the, of the gait the impression of the massiveness, the inertia of this large uh, subject. This focus on the Sasquatch's walk leads to an unusual experiment, one that will test if Dr. Meldrum's theory has legs. Could a man in a costume approximate the type of movements that are seen in the Patterson-Gimlin film? Dr. Meldrum is joined by lab director Dr. Jessica Rose and orthopedic surgeon Dr. Jim Gamble at one of the top facilities that examines bipedal motion, the Motion and Gait Analysis Lab at Stanford University. 
The lab studies and analyzes the gait of children with disabilities, often by capturing motion in 3D. Today, the clinic will focus on a special subject, Bigfoot. I thought it was an exciting question to determine whether or not a human could replicate that gait that's seen in the 1967 video. About the only thing we have about uh, Bigfoot is the way Bigfoot walks and then what's left from walking, like the uh, footprint. So I was very intrigued by the possibility of uh, looking into this. We have a actor, a subject, who is attempting to uh, depict the, the uh, posture and the gait that are evident on this film. Before the test begins, the team studies the film. And look at the arms, Bronson. See how they're swinging. His arms are relaxed. There's no tension in his arms. The degree of flexion of the knee is, is a critical issue. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, effort to clear the feet during the swing phase of the step. Right. He, he won't be able to achieve foot clearance by bringing the foot up. Like his head angle right there. The team also calculates detailed measurements of the famous creature. So um, now we'll see if we can replicate the Bigfoot gait. The experiment is first conducted without a costume, trying to imitate the Bigfoot walk. And that's a good arm position, and it yeah. stays about like that as you say. The gait is a challenging combination of limb movements. Gradually, all pieces of the walk come together. That's good. Again? Dr. Meldrum focuses on the effort involved. Well, this has been an interesting exercise for me to see how easily or not it would be for a human actor to attempt to mimic this posture that we see, uh, not outside the realm of human possibility, but it certainly takes a concerted effort on his part. Captured on video, the first batch of data is analyzed to see how closely the actor's movements mimic Sasquatch. One thing for me, since the trunk is flexed or is leaning forward, this creature won't be able to walk all day in the upright position. Bronston's performance is awesome. I think he's done a really tremendous job of matching the motion of the Bigfoot video. That begs the question, the fundamental question we're here to address is, could a person in a costume uh, approximate those values? Right, a human can replicate the kinematic parameters that we measured from Bigfoot. That, that's probably the major conclusion here. The actor will make one more attempt to imitate Bigfoot's gait, only this time under the constrictions of a bulky costume. How does that look? This is why they called him Bigfoot. <laughs> to get precise data, 25 reflective markers are attached to the fur suit. Okay, go ahead, Bronson. Once again, so Bigfoot enough. walks the walk. The suit itself could cause some of the differences in the gait. But with the forward lean, the, the feet become uh, more cumbersome, though, it seems. Like they're in the way even more. Did that? It's a little curved. Not but stiff, not but good. relaxed. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's good. There you go. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> to the naked eye, it looks like a match. But definitive proof will come from the final data in the motion capture system. When we return, what will the gate test reveal on Best Evidence? After 40 years, this film is still one of the most widely debated images in modern history. I think along with a lot of my colleagues that too much is being made of these images. Is it Bigfoot or a man in a fur suit? I was very intrigued. Assuming the hypothesis of a human in a costume. My name is Bronston Deloney and I play Bigfoot. Scientists at Stanford University, along with Sasquatch researcher Dr. Jeff Meldrum, conduct a series of motion tests. Could a man in a fur suit 
present himself in a convincing way, approximating the movements that we see on the Patterson-Gimlin film. I think it's a slam dunk. After analyzing the figure on film, the team attempts to see if an actor can replicate its unusual movements. Now the data is in, and the team comes to a conclusion on the mysterious Bigfoot gait. Will the data tell us that it was a man in a fursuit or an unknown primate living among us? We know that his gait, uh, as best we could see, approximated that, that of the Sasquatch. There's certainly no way to say from this uh, you know, whether it, it, it's truly a creature or uh, somebody in an outfit. My conclusion would be yes, it would be possible and feasible for a human to replicate that gait. When somebody is coached on how to walk, based on what we studied with the Bigfoot films, it's possible to replicate that, that way of walking. Frankly, I was somewhat surprised that our subject was so um, easily capable of replicating some aspects of, of the walk of the Sasquatch uh, depicted on the Patterson film. However, even the experts can see the gait test could not replicate all parameters of the Patterson film. There's no question that we do not have uh, all the variables, nor do we have all the answers. I don't think just because a human could replicate the gait that it means that, that it was a man in a costume. Despite evidence revealing that with practice, a human could replicate the Bigfoot walk, it hasn't diminished the substance of the film for this researcher. I'd have to say that, that the results of, of today's experiment um, have not really placed any uh, doubts in my mind about the credibility of, of the film. After viewing frame by frame the stabilized and enhanced Patterson-Gimlin film, other scientists believe it falls short of conclusive evidence. And the gait is odd because the proportions of this animal look similar to those of modern humans uh, and yet the gait appears to be nothing like it nor does anything in the gait look like any of the modern apes so it's it is really completely anomalous in the way that it moves Anthropologist Dr. Nina Jablonski still has serious doubts about its authenticity. It's hard to believe that these are real creatures because they seem to be anatomically inconsistent. They just don't jive with what we would expect. None of the images that we see of Bigfoot would fit our predictions of a large primate living in a forest. Paleoanthropologist Dr. David Began also remains unconvinced that the film supports the theory of an unknown primate. I'm not convinced that there is a distinctive gait that's present there that couldn't result from, frankly, wearing some sort of very uncomfortable, very bulky suit. I just think, I think along with a lot of my colleagues, that too much is being made of these images. But Dr. Meldrum remains undeterred by other scientists who suggest the film is one elaborate hoax. Well, in my mind, there is absolutely no substance to those claims to hoaxing, that in fact everything that I have experienced continues to point to the credibility of this piece of, of startling footage. He's convinced whatever's on that film could lead to new findings. I think it has uh, reinvigorated the discussion of, of this film, which is now nearly four decades old. Dr. Meldrum makes another key observation. If it was a costume in the 1967 film, it had to be extremely sophisticated. Both of my colleagues were also impressed by the fact that the costume which we had at our disposal today, which was a fairly elaborate costume, uh, paled by comparison to the anatomical details that were evident in the Patterson-Gimlin film. When we return, how will an Oscar-winning special effects master assess the footage? The more I see it, the more I think the head is just all wrong. Next, on Best Evidence. Assuming that this is a put-up job, uh, they didn't do a very good job at it. Is the Bigfoot, captured in this famous 1967 film, real or a tall person in a padded suit? Ape or hoax? I would say this is a hoax. Dick Smith is an Oscar-winning special effects makeup artist who was active when the Bigfoot film came to light. See that? It looks like a nice white nose sticking out there. The nose is right up there where a human nose would be. Look how high the dome of the head is, with all this hair camouflaging it. 
the soles of the feet come across is not pure white, but a light, solid color. I mean, there's no variation. I would do a lot of fancy painting on that uh, to make it look three-dimensionally contoured. There's nothing in there, as far as I'm concerned, that indicates that it's anything but uh, a big, bulky human in a suit. For decades, rumors have circulated in the movie industry about who created the suit. Johnny Chambers, who was the Hollywood makeup artist of uh, uh, much uh, fame, and who had done Planet of the Apes. I am doubtful that he was responsible for this because I consider this an amateur makeup job. He loved mystery, and, and he certainly liked notoriety, and so I think he just let everyone he just took the credit. Whether the Patterson-Gimlin footage of Bigfoot is real or a costumed hoax, evidence to support the existence of Bigfoot continues to divide the experts. I will not be convinced that there is any such thing as a Sasquatch until either I see a cadaver or, and most preferably, Bones. I think it's very important that scientists still engage in discussions about the possibility of Bigfoot and that we use all of our good scientific judgment to, to weigh it. When we finally get that carcass, it's going to be very interesting for me to see people saying, my goodness, what do we know about this? Why didn't the scientific community see it coming? The few scientists who remain committed to chasing the Sasquatch mystery do so with limited funding and great risk to their reputations. Many of my colleagues over the years have been surprised, if not shocked, at Dr. Meldrum's enthusiasm for this topic. Dr. Meldrum's zeal can perhaps be attributed to his own first-hand encounter. Two of us had gone off to a remote area to look for tracks and around off-trail lakes that were shrunken in the summer, in the summer heat. Um, and during that excursion, we had, uh, uh, we, we witnessed some interesting vocalizations in the wee hours of the morning, which were followed by the sounds of footfalls, uh, bipedal footfalls, soft padded footfalls rather than hard hoofed uh, footfalls that uh, came into our camp, in fact, brushed against the rain fly and something hit one of the poles, causing my tent to, to gyrate. I immediately jumped out of the tent as rapidly as I could extricate myself. And there beside the tent was a 16-inch oval imprint in the, in the grass, one of the few spots that would take a, a track of any type. A lot of people have taken risks in the history of, of the study of human evolution and been mocked uh, and derided for their, for their theories only to be proven correct. Uh, there are many, many examples of that. I'm not saying that Dr. Meldrum is correct, but I admire him for taking these risks, and I especially admire him for approaching the topic in as rigorous a way as he has done. I, I cannot walk away from this at this point. It's more incredible now to suggest that this all just be set aside than to pursue this to its, its uh, final resolution. Although the debate will continue, scientists agree on one point. If a species known as Sasquatch is ever confirmed to be living in today's world, it will rock the foundations of evolutionary history. Were Bigfoot ever to be definitively proven to exist?